Hello, my name is Ron Mann, and I'm going to show you how to use my fabric for Substance Designer. The first thing you want to do is to copy all of the SPS files as well as the dependency subfolder to somewhere on your hard drive where you'd like to store the materials. Make sure to move the dependencies folder with the files and keep it as a subfolder because this contains assets that are being used by the SPS Designer files. Once you're in Substance Designer, come over to Edit, Preferences. Now come down to Projects and in the library tab here, add the directory where you've put the materials on your hard drive to the project paths. You can do this by pressing the little plus icon here. Once you've restarted Designer, you should be able to find my materials in your library. I've created a really quick filter here to find all my materials by filtering by the tag Ronin. By doing so, you've got all 56 materials easy accessible to you at any time. I've tried to include a really broad range of fabrics, so you've got everything from cotton and silks to leather and fur to hopefully cover all your needs for texturing objects. So let's create a new empty graph and we can have a look at how the materials are set up. So I'm going to drag in this cotton here and we can have a look at how the material is set up. So I've dropped the node in my graph. If I zoom in and press 1 on the keyboard to show all the outputs of the material, you can see it outputs base colour, normal, roughness, metallic, ambient occlusion, height, opacity and scattering. It also outputs some channel packed textures as well as a fuzziness mask and displacement. These are mainly used for Substance Painter but can be useful for you in Designer as well. You'll notice that I've also grouped the materials so that the outputs will easily connect with any node that is set up to receive a material style input. So let's right click on the node and create the output nodes and I'll view these outputs in the 3D view. The materials are authored natively at 4K in resolution. So you can see the 4K textures have a lot of really fine detail and these are all scan based textures. Let's jump back to 2K as it'll be a little bit quicker when we're playing around with the parameters that are already set up for you. So when you select a material node, you get access to all of these nicely exposed instant parameters. At the top here, there's some attributes and a description of the material, as well as what tags you can search for in your library to find the material. Under the instance parameters, the very top drop down is for presets. You'll see here that every material comes with a scan preset. This allows you to reset to the scan default preset if you ever end up changing too many parameters down here and you just want to go back to the original scan. You can also reset it by clicking on this little icon here and reset to default value. This will reset all your parameters back to their original defaults. Firstly we can colorize the base color using a number of methods. You can use single color, two color or a three color mix. Let's start with a single color. You can see I can pick any color on the chart here and it mixes nicely with the fabric material. So you can see here the material changed nicely to this blue. We also have some parameters for how this color is applied. So if you open up this color one parameters, so in the first line here, you've got color hue variation. If I increase this hue variation, you'll see it starts to introduce slightly different colors into the mix, just so that your color combination isn't quite so uniform. You've also got chroma variation as well as luma variation. If I move this luma variation all the way down to the left, you'll see I'm losing some of the value separation that exists in the original base color. So if you really just want to overlay with a very simple color and you come all the way to the left, you'll see that the color pretty much overrides the base color. So this is a nice way of controlling the level of noise and detail in your materials. We can also switch to two color colorization. So now I get to choose a second color to mix with the first. So let's choose maybe an orange. So this takes these two colors and combines them together using the original base color luminosity as a mask. You've got extra controls over how these two colors are mixed. You can play around with the mask position here. So you can move it to the left and so you've got orange thread here with the blue inner pattern. Or if you move it to the right, you'll end up with the inverse, which is the orange in your pattern with the blue thread. You've also got a mask range. So if you really want to isolate further one part of the texture, you can reduce or increase its range. And finally, we've got a three color blend, which essentially takes three colors and combines them together to form the final base color. Again, you have control over how this third color blends with the other two.
After our colorizing parameters, we've got roughness control, so we can increase the shininess of the material. Or increase the roughness to make it more matte. Next, we've got normal intensity, so we can increase the normals that are being used on the material itself, or, or reduce them down if you're looking for a much more subtle, subtle look. You've got metallic control, in case you need a, a metallic fabric. So increasing that value here. After these high level control parameters, we've also got a technical parameters section. Let's just expand that out and move down and have a look at what extra control is available. At the top here, you've got base color contrast. This just takes the base color and adds or takes away contrast. So you can increase the contrast and the texture or reduce it to make it lower contrast. You've got luminosity. So you can uh, increase the brightness or, or make the material darker. The great thing to understand about these colorizing methods is that there is a PBR safe node at the very end of the base color, making sure that you don't go outside the range of PBR safe base color values. So the lowest you can make this black is 40 in the 255 range, and the same with the brightness values. It'll stop you going above PBR safe colors for a non-metallic surface. If your material is metallic, it'll adjust how it clamps these values. So this is a really nice way of colorizing your texture, all the while keeping PBR safe colors and values. Next up in the parameters, we've got some height control. In order to visualize this, let's turn on tessellation in the material. So come down to materials default, definitions, and change this to tessellation. And let's increase the scale for the tessellation. So if we increase the scale here, we can see the surface being tessellated and displaced by the height map. So now that that's active, let's have a quick look at what the height controls parameters do to affect the height map. Come back to our node and click on it here and come down to height again. We've got a height range and I'll just double click the height texture as well. So if we come back to our node and have a look at those height controls, we've got a height range control. So we can adjust the range of the height map, the difference between the highest peaks and the lowest troughs in the height map itself. So to the left here is sort of a lower contrast height map. Then we've got a height position, which is a slider just to move the height map away or, or, or closer to the surface relative to the, the, to the middle value. Finally, we've got a height relief balance slider. And what this does is to the left allows you to have a very low detail and bigger, softer shapes height map. So if I move this to the left, you'll see the height map has much less detail and it's a sort of a softer effect. And if I go all the way to the right, it's very high detail and very fine, fine noisy values. So you'll find with height maps and parallax occlusion maps, they tend to work better with slightly less detail. You don't want every little single pixel or triangle to be extruded by the, the height map. You can see here again, this is a nice sort of soft shapes. If I come all the way to the right, I get a very noisy effect. But you have the control here to add or take away the detail that you want. And all the way to the left here is a much softer tessellation and displacement of the surface. Next up is some AO control. If I move this slider to the left, this is just reducing the, the ambient occlusion map itself. So you can see here as well. This is the influence of the ambient occlusion on your material. It defaults to one. You've got an AO height scale, and this affects the contrast between the darkest recesses and the least occluded surfaces on the material. And this interprets the height map slightly differently. So if you come to the right, you'll notice it's a, a much higher contrast, uh, stronger ambient occlusion map. So we've got a lot more darkness in the little shaded parts but you might find that overall that's too strong. So you can come to the left here and see that it's a, a less contrasty ambient occlusion map. We've got an opacity map influence in case you want to have a masked material or masked surface in your end render. Let's have a look at how this slider affects the opacity map. So if I just slide this to the right, it starts to introduce the opacity map for this particular material. Next is scattering map influence, which is similar to the opacity map. If you bring it all the way to the left, you have no scattering map influence. And to the right, it uses the scan-based opacity map for this particular material. 
You can also quickly invert the scatter map in case that's the format that you need for your particular engine. So let's take a quick look inside one of these materials to see what's going on in the node graph. I'm just going to drag this here into my window and double click on the graph. So over here on the left you can see our scan based textures. These are 4K textures. They comprise of a base color, a normal map and a scanned opacity or scattering map. We then create a few additional maps like metallic, roughness, ambient occlusion and height. These nodes then pass through this custom exporter, which we'll talk about in a moment, and that creates the material outputs here. So base color, normal, roughness, metallic, ambient occlusion, height, opacity, scattering, as well as displacement, two channel pack textures, and a fuzziness mask. These four outputs are generally used for painter, and the channel pack textures are used for my Unreal Fabric Pack. So they comprise of scattering, roughness, metallic, and ambient occlusion, height, and fuzziness mask. Let's take a look quickly now at the exporter and what that does to the incoming inputs. So I'm going to right click open reference. And you can see on the left here, here are all my inputs. And from there, I'm doing the parameterized colorization of the base color. Here's some masking of the base color. And all of the various blend nodes that you see here are offering the control later on to tweak the various inputs, so the height or the scattering. These, these blend nodes allow you to adjust those values. And down the bottom here is a few nodes that we need for painter support and to support the fabric pack for Unreal 4. Uh, this packs the channels, so the scattering roughness metallic and packs the AO height and fuzziness mask. And we use the displacement output for Substance Painter because the height channel in Painter is often used for generating a normal map. And on the right here are all my exposed parameters that are used later on for tweaking the various values that you want to adjust on the final material. So it's a fairly simple setup, but it uses the export maps graph node so that we have a standardized setup for all of our materials. We have all the same parameters and all the same exposed options. And by using a single export maps node, it means we can make changes to the system later, and then we can just reload these materials and re-export them. Um, any changes we make here will be updated on those materials. If you don't use Painter or my Unreal 4 fabric pack, you can feel free to remove or disconnect this section here and its associated technical parameters. So that's a quick overview of what's happening within each material node graph, and it's the very same for all 56 materials in the collection. To explain the hierarchy of the pipeline, this SBS file is the origin or the source for all of the materials you use later in Painter or Unreal or Substance Alchemist. This SPS file is where you make all your changes. If you need to make tweaks to the setup or you want to add new parameters, this is where you do it. You can then export the SPS AR file, which is going to be used in Painter, Unreal or Alchemist from here. To do that, you click on the top level here of the SPS file and press this Publish Selected Elements button. This will ask you for a location to publish the SPSAR file and if you just export over the original SPSAR file, so this cotton diamond stitch and save over it, you will then update your painter, your Unreal and your Substance Alchemist in turn. So you can see it's a very simple hierarchy, you've got your SPS right at the origin at the source, any changes you make there and any changes you publish then trickles down to all your other programs. So let's take these materials and have a little play and see how you can combine them together and use them. So we'll take this this base cotton and maybe add a, a denim into the mix as well. Let's blend it with um, material blend, material hype blend. As I said, these materials are really quickly and easily connect to each other. And let's view this in the 3D view. That's okay. Let's just come back to our hype map here and invert that in the grayscale. Okay, let's come down here to our contrast maybe and our albedo matching. So you can see how you can very quickly make lots of new materials using these materials and substance designers. So maybe this is a slightly weathered version of it. And maybe we're not happy with this blue matching exactly. Come back to our, let's maybe match the original underlying color a little bit more. So maybe a bit more of a 
pale yellow. And you can play with the height offset. So this might be a wear value for this for this uh, cotton fabric and you can adjust the contrast so it's not so high. So now you're able to wear down that, that uh, cotton fabric. And so maybe I think that's a little soft. I can go back in here to my height map and change my relief balance to being a lot more detailed. So all of a sudden that changes the mask that I'm using for this height map blend. And I've got a lot of fine control over how much thread I want going through. So as you can see, these materials come with a lot of outputs. And as a result, you can get very complex and interesting combinations of, of all the different materials. So I can very quickly come down here and plug in maybe some leather instead. And maybe I want to increase the, the contrast of that blend. So now maybe I've got a, a, stitched, a stitched leather couch. Or I can bring down this, this leather here. And I've got a, a tarnished leather that's slightly damaged and broken, revealing the underlying uh, fabric underneath. So if I increase this contrast a little bit, get a bit of a harder edge, play with the offset. Maybe I can uh, in increase the resolution. So now I've got a really finely detailed material with lots of great information. It's PBR safe, color values. I can change the colors very quickly. Let's make that leather, for example, more. Let's make that a red leather instead. I hope you can see it's a very powerful collection of 56 scan based fabrics, all set up with the same easy to use parameters, all PBR safe and calibrated. Thank you for checking out my collection of fabrics. I hope you enjoy the pack. Thank you.